morning and thank you for joining us this bright and sunny and soon to be warm day. Um, we begin our service on page four of your bulletin. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Please kneel as able. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. You shall not commit murder. Amen. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. You shall not steal. Amen. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Taking a moment for reflection, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, 
And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, of unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day, and they ate the produce of the land. And the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. Please join me in praying Psalm 32. Let's use it, say it in unison. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt, and in no spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away, because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my confusion to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in the time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding must be fitted with pit and bridle, or else they will not stay here. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust the Lord. Be glad and righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true heart. Second Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he went off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen. For all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. <clears throat> But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Holy Spirit, guide us with your word. Amen. Please be seated.
Personally, I've never been a big fan of the parable of the prodigal son. <laughs> Having spent my whole life in the church, it just feels kind of overused to me. It's just another illustration of how God loves us no matter what we might do. While it's true, the sentiment isn't remotely surprising, and after who knows how many times hearing it, not even necessarily all that inspiring. So I didn't give a whole lot of thought to our gospel reading this week. But with our Hebrew Bible passage being so short and uneventful, and after a lot of busy work with Paul and almost no progress to show for it, I eventually realized I'd have to give the prodigal son another chance. And I'm glad I did. There's a lot more going on in this story than my presumptions allowed me to see. One of the first things to note is that neither Jesus nor Luke ever named this parable. In fact, no matter how familiar a parable might be, none of them have original titles. Just like the chapter and verse divisions, the story headers we know are ones that other people came up with later. And when we strip away some of these long-standing names, we sometimes start to see new details ones that might reawaken the story for our own context. Modern scholars suggest a lot of options for this one, like the parable of the loving father or the story of the two sons. Maybe one most relevant to our national situation today would be the parable of the polarized family. Each title change tends to redefine our focus, allowing us to approach the story in different ways. One commentator related this tale to the honor culture she experienced growing up as a Palestinian Christian in the Middle East, one that likely reflects society in Jesus' time as well. She calls this the parable of the father's prodigal love. According to Pastor Naveen Saras, placed within its cultural context, this story would have been absurd to Jesus' listeners. No one in the tale behaves honorably or as expected, except, maybe, the elder son. It's pretty easy to guess that it would have been inappropriate for the younger son to ask for his inheritance early. You might think it was kind of a jerk move, but he could have had good reasons for it. You know, maybe he found a really good investment opportunity or something like that. However, in context, his behavior was horribly offensive, essentially denouncing his family and telling his parents that he would be better off if they would just go ahead and die. The typical and appropriate response of a father in this situation would have been to disown the child, exiling them for bringing public shame on the family through such an unforgivable behavior. So when the father in the story quietly gives the younger son the money, that concept alone would have been nearly unthinkable to Jesus' listeners. But the oddities and potential misreadings don't stop there. The younger son goes on to bring even more shame to his family, not simply by squandering his property and dissolute living, but more so by the actions he takes after the money is gone. This man, obviously from a well-off family, completely abandons his station and hires himself out as a common laborer. And he isn't just any laborer. He becomes a servant to one of Judaism's most famously offensive and unclean animals. Falling from his aristocratic standing to becoming a slave to pigs would have been so humiliating that he would never have been able to return home, even if he had left on the best of terms. Yet, for some reason, the son decides that bearing those layers of public shame and bringing all of that trauma and embarrassment back onto his family is his most reasonable choice. He rehearses his apology and begins to head home, where we turn our attention again to his disgraced father. Wealthy or not, the father's community standing would have been precarious, not simply because his son had behaved so dishonorably in leaving. That would have been bad enough. 
But giving the, his child the money he demanded further revealed the father's lack of character. And now, to top off his already cringeworthy behavior, the father doesn't even wait for an apology. He doesn't maintain his seat as this most shameful of children approaches. Instead, he practically trips over himself, running to welcome back this infamous, infamous vagrant. The surprise at this point in Jesus' story probably doesn't lie where we think it does. It isn't just that the father embraces and kisses this shameful, destitute, unclean child. The shock is that the father runs. In his culture, dignified people didn't run. Children would run, messengers and slaves would run, but a wealthy person would never run. This man abandons what little dignity he has left to roll out the red carpet for a son who had irreparably harmed his family in the eyes of everyone who knew them. So, instead of this model of nobility and forgiveness we've come to expect, Jesus has presented his listeners with a thoroughly shameful household. The son has brought nothing but disgrace to the family. The father has become a joke in the eyes of the community. The only person left with any hope for a sense of standing at all would be the elder son, who's left to carry an undeserved burden. There's no way to excuse or forget his younger brother's behavior. The surrounding community probably thinks that his father is mentally unwell. In the midst of this chaotic family, he stands alone in trying to retain any sort of respect for social standing. And all of his hard work is met with nothing. Nobody cares. A community scandal is unfolding in his own front yard, and no one even thinks to tell him. He's out providing for this completely dysfunctional family, and they can't even remember to invite him to the party. Everyone has ignored him. It's like they don't even care if he exists. Heading home from his daily efforts to rebuild what little honor the family has left, he eventually has to bear the indignity of asking some neighborhood kid what's going on. It's no wonder he gets mad. He has a right to be mad the last upstanding member of a continually self-degrading clan. He gets why the town might ignore him, but now even his sham of a family doesn't find him worthy of their attention. Treated as an outcast among even the most shameless of society, it isn't that the elder brother simply won't join the party. Socially, he can't. His tattered sense of honor and self-esteem depends on it. And in this moment of inner turmoil, his father plays the fool one more time, leaving the banquet to try to convince his forgotten son to abandon his final shred of dignity and embrace the family's misbehavior. Way back at the beginning of the chapter, we hear that this parable is Jesus' response to some people grumbling about the company he was keeping how he welcomes tax collectors and sinners and eats with them. When we hear the word sinners, we generally think of bad people, or at least of people who do bad things. But that isn't necessarily the case, and the parable helps us see that a little more clearly. The word we see translated as sin in the New Testament doesn't necessarily hold the same association that we've been taught to give that word. We hear sin and think of things like we said in the Decalogue this morning, lying, stealing, adultery, and murder. But that isn't quite the right angle. Those things certainly fall under the category of sin, but this word is a lot broader than that. Sin here is related to archery, with the idea of missing your mark. Maybe your aim is slightly off, or you didn't pull the string far back Quite, not quite far back enough. Maybe the feathers on the shaft aren't right, or there's a rogue gust of wind. There are a variety of reasons someone might miss their target, but none of them need to be what we think of as sinful. They're just mistakes or errors. 
Something went wrong, and you have to live with the consequences. A New, Test New Testament sin is simply failure. And that's what we see in Jesus' parable. In our society, we get that the younger son is a sinner. He's a repentant one, but he's still not that great of a person. What's harder to see is that the father is a failure, too. He doesn't live up to society's expectation any more than his profligate child did. That doesn't make him a bad guy, though. He's clearly the kindest and most generous person in the story. He's been a role model for centuries. A misguided one, but a role model nonetheless. However, in the eyes of his society, he would also be seen as a sinner, a failure. The older son is in a miserable position. He can pretend that his family still has some dignity, but it's clear to everyone that that isn't the case. And it hasn't been for quite some time. He himself might not be a sinner, but he'll never get free of the association. So what should he do? Try to maintain a facade of propriety or accept his family's disorder and join the celebration? The fact is, all of us sin. All of us make mistakes, commit blunders, and miss the mark in a variety of areas. Some of us are just luckier than others and that our consequences haven't been as severe. So then, who do we look down upon? Who do we think of as society's failures? Who do we assume to be inferior, even if we recognize that someone hasn't necessarily sinned? How do we respond to, think about, or treat them? Do we distance ourselves, try to keep up appearances, or are we willing to embrace the chaos and shame that comes with our connection to the family of God? heard the word of the Lord, let's stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Holy and Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. for God's people throughout the world. For Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, and Michael Hunt, our bishop, for this gathering and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. 
ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. We ask your prayers for our parish family, especially Rose, Ed, Leonard, Elizabeth, Terry, James, Fran, Caitlin, Alden, and Rosie. In our Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of the Province of Myanmar. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Paul's in Artesia and St. Philip's in Berlin. Let us pray for our worship together, both public and private, in formal liturgies and in the way we live our lives, that all we do may give honor and praise to God. And for Winifred Adams, Arlo and Barbara Albers, Bob and Martha Anderson, Pat Anderson, and Frank and Joyce Anglin. We pray for those serving in the military, Will Ventain in Fort Riley, Kurt Compost in Alaska, Amanda Finnegan in Italy, Stephen Fry on the USS Farrell, <coughs> Daniel Fuller in Korea, Mary Samantha Katzenberger in Korea, and Trevor Rankin in Bremerton. We pray for our missionaries, Susan Hutchins and Mike Rollins, Perry and Sarah Mansfield, Sean Martin, the Mustard Seed Babies Home, and our rebuilding mission to, Saint, to Lake Charles. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. We remember John, Dorothy and Max, James, Lisa, John, Matthew, Jewel, Carlo, Harry, Doris, Stuart, Judith, Olive, James, Martin, Sammy, Bad, and Jeannie. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially St. Andrew. Pray that we may have, pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own way. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning, and once again, welcome to St. Andrews, whether you're joining us here in person or uh, on the internet. Time for announcements, as usual, there are quite a few here. Um, you can find most of them on the blue sheet of paper, the St. Andrews Gazette, that you can find uh, back by the ushers. If you didn't get one yet, I suggest you get, get a hold of that. Uh, it has a calendar for the week, things like that on there. Some things we would like to highlight are that um, we have trays out now for the reverse offering. For those of you who've been to 
uh, St. Andrews, before the pandemic, every once in a while we would pass plates with some slips of paper that have um, like a canned good or some sort of food item, maybe toilet paper or something like that on it that our office could use uh, as in their kind of food bank and pantry. Um, those are available now back by the ushers, uh, so please feel free to take one of those and drop off your gift. Also back there is the giving plate and guest packets if you're visiting with us today. Our ushers would like to have some more volunteers. We've got a few, few volunteers recently, but it'd be great to have more people join the team. Please talk to Bob Anderson after the service or contact the office. Uh, more volunteer opportunities. Uh, hospitality. We are planning to restart our coffee hour, uh, hopefully on Easter morning. Um, for this service, uh, if you could talk to Candace Fitch about joining in with that, if you'd like to help out, um, talk to her, contact the office again. Either way, it's a great way to get connected and hooked up with the community. Uh, this morning, just before the service, between the services, we had a solar presentation by John Nance in the gathering space. So John is from the 830 service. He has been working for months gathering information, facts, figures, talking to various city committees, things like that, about the possibility of St. Andrews installing some solar panels. Um, he has a presentation for that, uh, time for question and answers, those kinds of things. He'd love to see you after the service. Um, likely we will have another presentation two weeks from now on Palm Sunday as well, just to make sure that everybody can kind of share their thoughts and get the information that they need. For Easter, we have uh, Lilies for Memorials and Dedications. It's a $25 suggested donation. You can contact the office, please, no later than April 12th, so we can make sure to get your, your uh, designations, your memorials and such into the bulletin. May 7th, which is a Saturday, we have the church garage sale. So if you are doing your spring cleaning and discover that you have some excess furniture or electronics or any other hard type goods, um, you can bring those to the church or contact the church office. If it's a large piece, we can send somebody out to pick that up um, and raise money for our congregation. Um, with that though, they ask that you not include any clothing or shoes. So no clothing or shoes, but furniture, baskets, electronics, lawn equipment, whatever you want to do other than that would be great. Uh, into the more regular weekly events, Tuesday morning we have a morning prayer in the Kendrick Chapel at 9.30, led by Deacon Ann. Thursday morning we have the men's group meeting for breakfast at 8 o'clock at Las Trompas on Solano. Um, during Lent, there is a Stations of the Cross service here in the sanctuary at 11.15. And then that is followed at noon by our regular healing Eucharist in the chapel. So all three of those things happen on Thursdays. And finally, if you know anybody who would like to request a visit, please have them either contact me, my email is on the front of the bulletin, or the office so that we can get a visit, a, a, yeah, visitation arranged for those people. Okay, does anybody else have an announcement? Yes, D. Good morning. Um, if anyone would like to donate gently used books or purchase new books, La Cruces Public Schools is holding a literacy extravaganza downtown on April 14th um, for anyone in the city to come out and enjoy and learn some um, how to bring literacy into their lives. We would love to have you. It's from 4 to 7 on Thursday. that I've missed. <clears throat> All right, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries that would like a blessing today? Okay. Uh, last Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, some members of our congregation were able to join St. Anthony's uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church who meets in our Kendrick Chapel. 
uh, was able to join them for a prayer vigil for Ukraine back on the east side of the parking lot, or east side of the building. Um, I heard a lot of good things about it, and Father Mark from St. Anthony's uh, shared some of the prayers with me. I'd like to do one of those prayers for Ukraine this morning. Lord our God, great and almighty, we, your sinful children, turn to you with humility in our hearts and bow our heads low before you. We beseech your loving kindness and abundant blessings upon the people of Ukraine during these days of great danger to their safety and well-being. Our brothers and sisters, Lord, are threatened by aggressors who see them only as obstacles blocking the path to the domination of their precious land and resources. Strengthen the people as they face this great danger turning to you in immeasurably deep faith, trust, and love that they've placed in you all their lives. Send your heavenly legions, O Lord, to crush the desires of the aggressor whose hope is to eradicate the people. Grant unity of mind, heart, and soul, O Lord, to all leaders in public service with those they serve. Hear us, O Lord, and have mercy. Unite us all into one great Christian family, so that together, as brothers and sisters, we may glorify your majestic name, God and the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. And now, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself a sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be to you, us the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be made acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with Mary and Andrew and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us bow our heads before the Lord. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength, so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 